I'm Jake Brown, uh, Energy Services Planner here at VEC. Welcome to today's webinar, VEC and the Modern Electric Grid, What You Need to Know. We have two highly qualified presenters today, uh, VEC's CEO, Rebecca Town, and Innovation and Technology Leader, Sorrell Brunner. Both have deep experience in the energy sector, and they'll offer some high-level information about where VEC is headed. And at the end of the presentation, we'll take your questions. We have well over 150 uh, registrants for the webinar today, so it looks like a broad range of folks who are tuning in, VEC members, stakeholders, and our board of directors. We even have some people from out of state and uh, had one registrant from Australia, so we are, we're hearing from a lot of folks here. A quick note, uh, participants are muted, uh, but you can ask questions via the Q&A function. Click on the icon and type any questions or comments into the window at any time during the webinar. We're recording the webinar and we'll send the link to all registrants after we're done. Uh, so with that, we'll get right into it. I'll hand things over to Rebecca to start us off. Okay, well, good morning, I guess now afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Jake, for the introduction and for putting this together. I'm going to start here with just a little grounding in Vermont Electric Co-op for those of you maybe who aren't as familiar which is uh, that we serve Northern Vermont, 75 communities in Northern Vermont. This is a photo of Newport City, which is our largest city that we serve. It's nestled right up against the Canadian border. And today we are going to spend some time talking about some of the challenges and opportunities that we are navigating as we transition to a clean energy future and continue to maintain um, our service to uh, all of those communities through our 2,500 miles of line. First, a little framing. So our energy world is changing quickly. If you're on this webinar, you probably have a sense of the fact that that is true. Um, everything from the fact that climate change is driving some pretty drastic, impactful weather, um, all the way to increased intermittent renewables and thinking about how to incorporate those into the grid. We'll talk about that some today. Also, heating and electrification is growing and growing low, transitioning those areas to use electricity as opposed to fossil fuels. From a grid perspective, we're talking about a more decentralized grid. So it used to be all centralized, generation would flow out to the homes. Now we're seeing a lot more solar storage, other types of devices out on the grid and figuring out how to interact with those in a very cohesive way is one of our big challenges and opportunities. And then finally, just the piece around technology. So not just in, you know, across every sector, technology is changing dramatically, which does create some great new software and pieces for us to be able to pick up and operate the grid in a ways we've never been able to do before. And also some challenges thinking about um, cost and integrating technologies and figuring out when and which technologies to move forward on um, as, as we see this evolving world. But over on the other side of the screen, you'll see that triangle about our shared goals. And that is what is staying consistent. So since we were founded in the late 30s, our mission has been to deliver affordable, reliable, safe energy services to our members. That hasn't changed. And when we talk to our members through member surveys and getting out into the community, we know that affordability and reliability continue to be the most important characteristics of the grid to them. We also know our responsibility has never been more important. So as the energy world becomes more complex, it's our job to continue to make sure it's really easy for our members to navigate that so that we manage the complexity and don't ask our members to do that that we're resilient. We know that our members are counting on us for school, for medical appointments, for all kinds of things that they never used to before. So if the power does go out, being able to have that back on as quickly as possible is more important now than ever. And then equitable, making sure that everyone in our community has access to um, some of the new technologies and some of the new opportunities. Um, and then finally, transitioning to a clean energy world, which is a lot of, um, which again, right behind affordability and reliability, we know that that's what's most important to our members. And we're making constant strides, not just as VEC, not just in Vermont, but regionally and across the world to be able to transition to a clean energy supply and reduce our carbon impact. Along those lines, we are 
this year, um, after a few years of work, uh, making sure that we are delivering 100% carbon-free energy on an annual basis to our members. And that is primarily made up of hydro. Hydro is our biggest uh, piece. We also have a good slice of nuclear and wind and solar that make that up. And our goal is to be able to get to 100% renewable in 2030, again, on an annual basis. And the big shift there will be taking out that nuclear slice of the pie and replacing it with renewables. So with that clean energy supply, this is looking at Vermont as a whole, not just VEC, but in Vermont, electricity is only 2% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And what you'll hear us talk about today is that as we think about Vermont reducing our, our carbon load, our greenhouse gases, it's really those bottom two areas. It's really thermal and transportation, transitioning those to electricity. That is how Vermont is going to lower our carbon impact. And for us, that looks like growth, and it also looks like managing a lot more um, usage and devices and needs on the electrical grid. You'll hear more about that from Sorrell later. We are seeing adoption of heating and transportation. We're seeing adoption of lots of electrification, everything from um, lawn mowers to weed whackers, um, but really the big drivers are the heating and transportation. Those are the ones that use the most electricity and also impact people's lives the most. This is sort of a busy graph, but it gives you a flavor of the fact that all the numbers are still small. The pace of adoption is growing, and we expect that to continue over time, both for electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and then heat pumps, water, water, um, hot water heat pumps, and then uh, air heating and cooling as well. want to spend a little time talking about energy burden. So energy burden is the percentage of household income that is spent on energy. And that is not just electricity, that includes um, gas for vehicles, that includes heating. So it's really all of those energy sources altogether. The red and orange in this photo are Vermont towns. Um, oh, actually all the colors are Vermont towns, but the red and orange are those towns with the highest um, energy burden, meaning the highest percentage of household income going towards energy spending. And more than half of the highest energy burden towns in Vermont are in VEC territory. So we are aware of not only that we have a lot of folks who struggle with their energy burden, but that affordability is our members' highest priority. And as we think about the transition to heating and transportation to electricity, we know that the operating costs for those can be lower. So there is an opportunity to lower that energy burden and the adoption cost and the process to adopt those new technologies is often a hurdle that a lot of people can't overcome. And that's a lot of our um, thinking and focus and, um, and challenge, uh, I think, not just for us, but um, across the country. I want to transition, since we're talking a lot about challenges of transition, to talking about the region. And this is important because uh, we operate, you know, Vermont's a small state. We love it, but we're small. And we are part of New England. We're part of a region that is all working on a transition to renewables. And while we are really proud of the fact that we are 100% carbon free this year and we'll be transitioning to renewables, that's really on an annual basis. And as all of us transition to renewables, we have some, again, challenges to think about, about every hour of the day, how we deliver that same reliability, even when renewables are intermittent. So again, a busy slide, but give you a flavor of some of the complexity we deal with. This is New England in the summertime, and it shows you daytime versus nighttime and how much renewables there is in the daytime and at night, how much more that gets covered by natural gas and other types of resources. So again, a regional challenge and something that we have to think about to be able to continue to focus on that transition to clean energy, but also that reliability at the same time. And of course, how to do it in a, an affordable way. So that's a lot. Now I'm going to transition to Sorrel for even more. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, yeah, real excited to have so many of you on here. It looks like 75 participants. So that's definitely exceeded our expectations. So really appreciate all of you joining. I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, VC's uh, particular strategy and challenges that we face when it comes to this electrification. So we're projecting a pretty significant increase in electric sales by 2040, 40%. I mean, that's great for our bottom line, great for our business. 
But with that comes some challenges on, on the electric grid. So um, some projections that we have here are almost a doubling of our existing peak load. And that peak load is, is really um, what we design the system to, what a lot of our costs are um, drawn upon. And uh, most of that load growth is coming from electric vehicles and heat pumps, as you can kind of see in this right side chart. <clears throat> so how does this affect the grid? Um, there's many different aspects to this electrification that we pay attention to. So there's obviously the home usage. So uh, an electric vehicle has anywhere between seven and 15 kilowatts because some of these new vehicles are up to 19 actually. So if you compare that to the existing house loads that we see, right, that's almost a five, six X increase um, and navigating that along with the impacts of the service transformer, the impacts of the poles and wires that all of you drive past on a daily basis, our substations, and then also the region, as Rebecca had talked about prior, um, those assets and, and the costs associated with them are, are directly related to the load on the grid. So our strategy to address these impacts is, is um, kind of fourfold here. So our fundamentals and our foundations are, are the same as they've been for many years, maintaining our existing um, poles, wires, transformers, upgrading the system to make sure that there's enough capacity to serve and keeping things reliable. And then newer things that we've done over the last few years is partnering with our members on flexible load programs. I'll touch on those in a little bit here. And also investing in utility scale uh, flexibility that's really focused on uh, reducing those transmission impacts and participating hopefully in new markets that are coming out um, as a result of this energy transition. This is a quick photo of my two dogs, Dexter and Tucker, and my Ford Lightning. Um, obviously, we have a variety of incentives through our energy transformation programs, and I think I touched on these EV loads and how significant they are. From a grid standpoint, we do a couple of things to address that. We do have uh, discounts in the case of service transformers. We do a free service transformer for electric vehicles that's um, justified based on the economic value of the additional sales coming from those electric vehicles. And we also have a, a clean air program, which we call CAP. And this program is really geared towards um, line extensions for um, homes that are off-grid or sugar makers. We recently did a sawmill up in the Albany area. Um, and there's all sorts of um, opportunities associated with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about managed charging, um, which is a big topic and a big focus of ours. Obviously, we touched on how important the electric vehicle and how large the electric vehicle load growth is on the system. So for us, managed charging is a, is a great way to reduce those uh, impacts, um, reduce the transmission costs. And it really revolves around the fact that there's excess grid capacity during the night and often also during the day when there's so much solar. So our goal is really to shift that load from those peak times, typically 4 to 9 p.m., um, to the evening or to, to the daytime. And, and the way we can do this is because the average charging time for an electric vehicle is typically around three hours. That's the average we've seen on, this, on the system so far. Most people are driving between 40 and 60 miles a day. Um, and that three hour time window is enough to, to cover that distance. Um, so if we shift that to 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 12 p.m., right, that automatically reduces the amount of infrastructure that we need to invest in. Just to talk a little bit about our managed charging, our flexible load program. Um, this is actually a photo of one of our members, Chi Wen. She's in Montgomery. Um, she loves her electric vehicle, along with all sorts of other wonderful electric products that she's purchased over the years. Um, our program offers a free level two charger. We also do an $8 a month bill credit. We have around 120 EV chargers under management. And um, since the program began, we had less than 10 opt-outs, right? So that's pretty good ratio wise if the program began in 2020. So the real beauty of this program is not only does this reduce the cost of the EV that that member purchased, but it also reduces costs for all VC members, regardless of whether or not they're EV drivers. And a lot of our programs actually revolve around that sort of economic model. So not only are we reducing carbon and helping folks reduce their uh, energy burdens, but it's actually helping the entire membership, which is really great. Just to quickly touch on batteries, this is a photo of our Heinsberg battery. Um, we, we have a couple utility scale projects uh, that are underway, one that's been completed. We also have a bring your own battery program. I know there were a couple questions on, on that already in the uh, pre questions for the registration. That, that program offers uh, an incentive on monthly bill credit to utilize that battery. We have around um, 80 batteries enrolled at around 55 homes. 
So that's been pretty successful. And then next year, we're really excited to be able to announce a grant funded low moderate income program that's going to operate very similar to the GMP model, where basically there'll be a, a lease or a, a monthly payment to uh, get a battery at your home, and then we'll use it for uh, peak shaving benefits. So I'm going to pass it back over to Rebecca to talk a little bit more about the region. If I unmute, it works better. <laughs> All right. Um, so just a little bit more about the region before we dive into some of the Q&A. This is looking at New England. So Sorrell talked a little bit about, as did I, about the fact that electrification of heating and transportation is going to be a big game changer, not just for reducing carbon, but growing load on the grid. And we're seeing that not just in Vermont and VEC, but also in the region. So this is a graph of New England through 2032. And these are showing from between 2023 and 2032 what those peaks will look like, particularly in the winter. Um, the, the winter ones are the higher ones and summer peaks. So really something that we're all going to be working with is, is thinking about how does our regional grid and then also how does our grid in Vermont support this growing electrification. Um, and then the next slide, Sorrel. Okay, I'm going to pause for just a moment on this because it's super busy. There's a lot here. <laughs> And uh, believe it or not, we actually like made this slide less uh, less confusing from the original one. But again, the, the idea here is to give a flavor of we are not in this alone. We're part of a region. And um, that means we are thinking about those generation supplies and that growing load from a regional perspective. This is showing really sort of what's coming down the pipe. So ISO New England manages what's basically a queue for new resources that are coming on. And so that circle over to the left, you'll see a couple of things that are interesting. One, there's a tiny slice of natural gas, which we anticipate we will continue to need in a regional perspective just to cover some of those time periods when there's not renewables generating. But most of what you're seeing is a whole pile of wind, a lot of offshore and some onshore, and a whole pile of solar and then a bunch of storage. And the storage is really to match up with that intermittency to help the renewable resources go further um, and cover more hours of the day. And really thinking about what that looks like in terms of where it's located and then what those offshore wind places look like. So again, just trying to give a flavor of um, how some of those resources will continue to evolve from a regional perspective uh, and what that's gonna mean in terms of how, how we manage not just our own power contracts, but also thinking about those, what is connected to the grid and how does that become interwoven? Okay, great. Wow, that was a lot of slides. And when people registered, we got somewhere, I think around 40 questions just in the registrations. We tried to interweave some of those into the slides and conversation that you've heard already. And then we're going to take a few now and sort of do a Q&A session. And we had four different conversations about how to do this smoothly. I'm not sure if we figured out exactly how to do it perfectly, but um, we're just going to try to walk our way through it. So I'm going to start um, by giving Sorrel a question, and then we're just going to do some back and forth and just sort of um, dive into some of those. There is the Q&A that um, any of the participants can, can add some of your questions in. So if you didn't submit it or our presentation so far has added additional questions for you, then uh, please pop it in and we'll be looking at that too. All right, Sorrel. So you talked a lot about um, some of our battery programs and also being able to manage electric vehicle chargers. And one of the questions that came in is, how is it going? How's it going? How's the management of those devices working? Yeah, uh, great question. I would say it's going well so far. Um, it's early days, right? We have low quantities of devices. So we're really trying to experiment as best as possible and learn from those experiments. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we faced has been communicating with these devices. That can be that can be a challenge. Um, we're, we're navigating how to do that effectively, whether that's through customer Wi-Fi, whether that's through cell, whether that's through other means. 
And uh, we found some good ways to, to navigate that. And I would say in general, um, the, the uptime of those devices has been successful. The amount of people enrolled and participating in those programs has been really successful. I think I mentioned in my slides that our EV charger program has had less than 10 opt-outs. So in general, we feel that our strategy and ability to manage these devices is going to be, uh, it's going to work into the future. And, and right now we're really focused on how can we take these early experiments, learn from them, and turn them into kind of pilots and programs that are going to last into the future. So um, we decided we're going to ask each other questions. So this is going to be fun. So I, I get to pick another one here, which I think is a good one. Great, great question. So looking into the crystal ball, what will the system look like in three years? And then what will it look like in five years? And maybe that's the same, but I feel like that's a great question to ask. Um. Great question. Uh, so I think, you know, it's interesting because I think in three years, it's not going to look that much different than it does today because our planning horizon, the way we're looking at these things is really in like a 10 year, 20 year horizon. And that I think is um, why it's so important to talk about these challenges now, because now is when we're starting the planning and the thinking about investments and thinking about what we do today. That being said, I think we are going to continue to see that same growth of adoption of electric vehicles and heat pumps. So we're going to see more things out on the grid that use a lot of energy. We're going to start to see more solar panels. So we already have high solar infiltration or um, penetration is the word I wanted to say. High penetration in Vermont, I think we'll continue to see a lot of solar penetration distributed models. And I think over the next three to five years, I'm very hopeful that we'll start to see a lot more options and technology integrated. So let me talk about that just a little bit, because I know there were a lot of questions around like, what about nuclear or what about green hydrogen or what about, you know, geothermal or some of these other technologies? Uh, what about, there was another great question around um, long duration storage. And I think those are all great questions. So my hope is that in three to five years, we'll know a lot more about some of those technologies, particularly on the storage side, particularly on, um, there's a lot of pilots now going on around how hydrogen might integrate with the grid and how small modular nuclear might integrate with the grid. And a lot of the federal dollars are putting a lot of R&D money into these things. And so in that three to five year time frame, I think we will start to see some of the outcomes of these pilots, or at least they'll be in production as opposed to just a grand idea. And what we're at the distribution level and we don't own generation. So our role as a distribution cooperative is really to monitor and to understand and to pay close attention to those pilots so that we can understand when and how to be able to incorporate them in ways that really advance towards our goal. I will also just say that a lot of those um, pieces that we talked about, so the New England projections and you know, our own projections, everything we're talking about today, we are, we are doing some of those graphs, some of those charts, some of those things, based on today's technology. So I have no doubt that in five years that will look different because we'll be able to incorporate some of those technologies, but the what and the how and which technologies and what that looks like is a great question. And so what we're really doing is sort of, you know, asking those same questions too and really monitoring some of the folks who are putting those, those things into play. So um, I'm excited and optimistic for the future. I hope I hope we can talk more concretely about some of those things as um, as things move forward. All right. Um, so we talked a lot really high level, Sorel, and now I'm going to pick sort of a practical, tactical question that I think a lot of people ask us as we go out and about, which is if we're planning to purchase an EV, what's the process for knowing our costs for connecting a charger, whether we'll need to pay for a transformer upgrade or other upgrades? Like, what does it look like if you want to buy an EV and need to think about the electrical side of it? Yeah. Good question. I see that's from Laura Caps. Hi, Laura. Um, <laughs> good, good to see you on here. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's a couple of pieces, right? There's the particular cost of the EV, and, and we'd highly recommend going to the Drive Electric site 
um, which is operated by Efficiency Vermont. Um, and, and they have some really great information there on cost of EVs, total ownership costs, those types of things to really inform you on, on what you should expect, right? I think the long-term total ownership of cost of, of, of an electric vehicle is often significantly less than a, than a gas IC vehicle. And when it comes for, for the grid pieces, um, that's something that um, we'd highly recommend you give us a call on. We're happy to kind of walk you through that process. Um, I would say that in particular, as it relates to the transformer upgrade pieces and the system upgrade pieces, those are things that we pay attention to. And so every incentive that comes through VC today for an electric vehicle, we actually have our engineering team review and, and take a look at and, and, and reach out if there's any work that we need to do in general. Um, the costs for those, as I mentioned, the service transformer is free for an electric vehicle, so there should be no costs associated with that. And in general, these system upgrade costs, i.e. if we need to upgrade a substation transformer or a line, are, are going to be the brunt. Uh, that's going to be something that we pay for, right? That's our responsibility is to keep the capacity on the grid available um, for, for folks to electrify. Um, the, the charger piece is, is the one that's the most complicated. That'll range based on your service panel. And, and, and so we'd highly recommend that if you are considering that, reach out to an electrician. Um, they should be fairly familiar with what this process looks like to, to get that 240 volt circuit into your garage or wherever it needs to go for the charger. Um, and that part can, can be the most complicated and confusing. So I would highly recommend reaching out to a local electrician or um, there's a couple other resources that might give you some high level estimates of what that is. Um, let's see. Wait, here. wait, before you ask yeah, me a question, I want to ask a follow on, which I thought okay. was another great sort of practical question. Um, which came from Michael, which is what, what hours are best for charging an EV? Your graph suggested later evening to early morning. Can you be more specific and maybe talk about what that looks like today and how we think that might change in the future too? Yeah, great. Good follow-up. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the biggest thing that we're focused on today is managing our transmission peaks. And those peak times typically happen between 4 and 9 p.m. Those are different than potentially the peaks that happen on the system, on the distribution system, on your service transformer. And today, that's the, the transmission peak is the revenue that we can realize. So that's what we're focused. That's how we economically justify our programs today. And so those peaks are typically four to nine. So, so really any time outside of that four to nine window would meet that criteria. And I would say that's that's where we're at today. Our hope is that we're able to, to manage these EVs also for these infrastructure peaks. Today, we're not seeing a significant amount of electric vehicles to cause grid challenges, right? That number is increasing, but it's not increased so much yet that the grid is unable to sustain that electrification. But we anticipate due to that rapid growth that that's going to change. So I think it's a tough one to answer. My engineering brain is working here a little bit, sorry. But uh, you know, generally the evenings, any hour after like 10 to 5 a.m., your 11 to 5 a.m. number is, is a pretty good time for most of the system. Now, some of our circuits are primarily dominated by sugar making is the peak that drives those circuits, right? Those are on all the time. So that that's that's a different challenge that we have to navigate. But for your typical residential circuit, residential neighborhood, right? 10 to 5 a.m. is generally a pretty quiet time, right? Folks aren't using their washer dryer properly. They're not running the dishes. They're not doing those sort of things. So um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, okay, let me just look through here. Uh, Ross had a good question here. What percentage of people are going to generate their own electricity and leave the grid? I feel like that's a question we get fairly often of what that's gonna look like. Yeah. Some good questions here. <clears throat> well, I wish I knew the exact amount of that <laughs> question because it would be easier for planning. Um, what we're really seeing though is so there's sort of two different things actually. One is we're seeing a lot of people wanting to generate their own electricity um, and we're not seeing them leave the grid. We're actually seeing a, we're actually seeing the reverse that we have a community, I believe down in Hinesburg, maybe Huntington that was off grid and actually work together to build a line extension so that as their solar panels expired, they could they could still generate some of their own electricity, but now had the backup of the grid. And that's really the trend that we're seeing. Um, I would say we have, again, a pretty high penetration of net metering. Sorrel, do you remember our percentage of members that net meter right now? You know that uh, off the top of your it's head? It's like 3,3500 3, folks, so roughly 10%. Okay. 
about 10%. Okay, that sounds about right. So right now we have about 10%. And we're seeing that grow every year. I expect that there will be a cap to that. Um, because really you start to get into people who either don't want it on the roofs or live in multifamily housing or have some way that uh, they uh, feel like they either don't have the time and resources or they don't want to or some other piece. And really that's where we, that's our role is to, even if you don't generate your own electricity, we've got you covered. We're 100% renewable. We're 100% carbon free and we will be 100% renewable. And for those folks who just want to be able to turn on that light switch and feel really good about the fact that they're using clean energy, um, we that's, that's what we do. And it's annual now. And then eventually we'll cycle to be on a more hour by hour basis. And even for people who generate their own electricity, they're not, they're not, generating their own every hour, right? They're using their own when the solar is generating and the rest of the time they're relying on their grid as basically their battery and their backup. Um, so there you go, 10% and growing. I'm not sure what that cap is. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, We should probably share too. I mean, we have an employee at the company who's actually off grid and uh, they've, they've been Thank like you. working through many years. They've been doing this for a long time and uh, they have a wind turbine they have some backup batteries. They have a generator. Um, they're, they've been trying to make that work. And, and it, it's interesting to talk to that employee because often what they'll say is, um, you know, that it's, it's hard work. It's a lot of monitoring this thing, right? I mean, obviously we do a lot of work here at VC to keep that grid working. And I think with today's technology, especially with battery and storage and solar, um, I'd, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in more details, to look at our integrated resource plan on our website. We actually did some analysis on the size battery that you would need. Um, to basically make it through the winter months with 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 the solar quantities that we have. And that battery was basically like the equivalent of 10 to 15 power walls, right? Which is a pretty significant cost. Um, and so hopefully that adds some flavor to that question. Yep. I also would add one more piece. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our community solar program. So we have solar arrays. We have three solar arrays um, that are... Uh, community-based. So any of our members can sponsor panels as part of that solar array and participate um, in that way if they don't want to host their own solar panel. And so it's very cost-effective. And uh, we have a lot of members who really like that option. It basically is similar um, to putting solar on your own roof and that you have an upfront payment. You can take out a low-cost loan for that. And then each month it sort of cuts down your energy bill. So um, that's an option too. Lots of ways. We got a good kind of like pivot question here from Steve, which is what is being done to improve resiliency of the grid to reduce the exposure of outages like we did in the December 2022 storm. Then he has a little second follow up here, which says, do you encourage members to install backup generators or will you assist with battery backup or is the grid being hardened to an ounce of prevention pounder of cure approach? Yeah. Great question. Um, I'll start Sorel and then maybe you can chime in too because I know Sorel was um, our engineering manager for many years and so spent a lot of time thinking about the physical resiliency of the grid. And before, before the uh, webinar, we also got some questions around cybersecurity and also around regional outages and our connection to Hydro-Quebec and sort of all of those pieces are how we think about that reliability and resiliency. So I'll talk first around the storm and um, you know, the December 2022 storm was rough and it was right through the holidays and um, it took a really long time to restore. And so two things I will say about that is, um, one is that, sorry, hold on, I need to take a drink of water. Um, we had a, a similar weather event a few years prior and we were able to cut a couple days off of that restoration time from the prior event. And while that is zero comfort to anyone who was out during Christmas and for five days and had to endure, from a long-term perspective, it is proof that some of the initiatives that we're putting in place are helping. And one of the other things is that we were um, we applied for and received a FEMA grant to be able to rehabilitate a couple lines um, from 2017 that went down during that 2017 storm. And those did not experience outages um, in 2022 during that December storm. So they really were resilient. And so the long-term answer is little by little, 
trimming line by trimming line and rewiring line by rewiring line and undergrounding where we can, we are working on making our system more resilient. Um, that is a slow, long process. Um, and I share those talking points just as proof that it is working and it's gonna take a really long time because we have 2,500 miles of line. So we are doing that at the same time that we're looking at where do we need to expand capacity to support additional electrification. Those are all investments. They take investments of money. They take investments of people and resources. Um, so being very thoughtful and strategic about where we do those um, is part of what our team spends a lot of time thinking about and planning. And we only have so much. We can't, you know, we can't do, we can't fix everything all at once. Um, so there's that. And vegetation management, we know, is a big piece of that. And the other thing that I would say is we do... Um, it is, we do appreciate our members need power more than ever. And also we just still live in a very rural area with a lot of trees and we know the weather is getting wackier. And so the truth of it is, is that we, um, not everywhere do we have ability to be able to provide as much reliability as we would like. We keep working at it and improving every year. Um, and so we do encourage our members to think about what their backup options are. We, whether it's a generator or a lot of people have wood fires or, you know, whatever that looks like from uh, um, uh, heating and transportation and all those kinds of things. I, we are sort of starting to dip our toes into a couple places is one is to think about battery backup and what that looks like. Um, so Sorrel mentioned a program that we're hoping to roll out sometime in 2024. That's gonna, it's only 75 households, but hopefully it'll be helpful for people to have batteries as opposed to generators and also be able to use it for peak management. And then one of the other projects we're working on and I'll shift it over to you Sorrel because I think you've been really closely involved with this project is in Craftsbury, we've been working on a microgrid. And the idea is that not only will they will be able to stay up but they'll have a car charger. And so we're thinking about as people transition to electric transportation, they're gonna need that back up there too. And, and how do we think about that from a reliability and resiliency standpoint when we know it's probably gonna be impossible to make, um, you know, to, to out, out completely outwit mother nature and not have any outages. So over to you, Sarah, for what else you want to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it really comes down, you know, as, as a small rural co-op focused on affordability, right. That we were really trying to kind of like maximize the amount of work we can do with the limited resources, both people and time, right. That's the big challenge in the infrastructure space always. Um, and so I think like the battery backup space and the reason why we're focused on this crafts rain micrograde project is again, because it mixes this, uh, potential savings that we can get from using that battery to reduce transmission peaks, and then also give us the benefit of the reliability piece, right? So you have this nice duality for us to just go out and put a battery strictly for reliability. We can't make that economic justification today with the models that we have in place, right? But if we leverage the trans reducing the transmission peaks component of that battery backup, then all of a sudden our grant funding, as you just brought up, Rebecca, then all of a sudden those propositions become become better. And I'll just quickly say on the backup generators piece, we do a member survey every year. And over the last few years, we've been asking the question about how many of our members have backup generators. And what we found is almost half do, right? So, so that's a pretty large percentage of folks who, who have made that investment, often a much smaller investment, right, than a, than a big battery storage uh, uh, backup might be. And, um, you know, so I, I would say we're not necessarily encouraging members to do that, but it certainly seems like a good idea. Um, I know I recently installed one myself. And, uh, you know, these major events, our outage numbers are decreasing. But these major events are increasing in severity, right? And so, um, it's it's what we're seeing is that those those storms are are, are going to continue, and and uh, our ability to underground lines, relocate lines, invest in the system is going to take time, um, and and so finding the happy medium there is is, is key. So. Good. I did just want to hit on um, a couple more pieces to that question because I think they're really important. Um, one is cybersecurity, which I'll have you talk more about, Sorrel, because I know you've spent a lot of time in that area, um, but also our connection to Hydro-Quebec and, and how that helps with our resiliency. And, um, you know, VEC is in a pretty unique spot that we are both connected to ISO New England. We also get service from Hydro-Quebec up in the Northeast Kingdom because we, we border Canada. Uh, and so, 
um, we do have a lot of benefit that we can transfer over some of our system to the hydro Quebec system. So if there were catastrophic failures in um, ISO New England or New England, um, some sort of big blackout or some sort of um, major reduction in power, like we saw in Texas that happened, then our connection to hydro Quebec is a very unique um, opportunity for us. And our team has spent a lot of time making sure that we have the ability to capitalize on that um, as sort of a backup backup plan. So we are thinking about those things and we are uh, lucky that where we're geographically located, uh, that we have that as an option that lots of people don't. But also we spend a lot of time in talking about the backup backup plan in cybersecurity and thinking about what that looks like. So maybe you could address that just quick, Sorrel. Yeah, we had, we had a couple of questions pre about just kind of what we're doing from that, whether or not we have a security plan and we do. So, so cybersecurity for us is really focused in two areas. Uh, there's obviously the physical security, i.e. our substations and our assets. And we do have, you know, rigorous camera system, a lot of focus on fencing and, and uh, sensors around, you know, making sure that those critical facilities are both monitored and protected adequately. And then the second piece is really our, our technology um, and, and, and those platforms. So the, the technology that we use to manage the system, the SCADA system, as it's called, is actually isolated from the internet, which is really helpful from a from an attack standpoint. Um, and if we need to, it's got like one small key point. If we need to sever that, we can. We do have the ability to do so. And we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, investing in software tools, investing in our staff to manage, you know, what is increasingly a daily threat. We get attacked on a daily basis. Um, we have ways to navigate those attacks, whether it's to our staff, you know, trying to get phishing attempts, just like I'm sure you've all received many random text messages from this random tracking Amazon package that you didn't order. Um, we get tons of those, especially our CFO. She gets plenty asking for bank credentials. Um, and, and so, you know, our focus is obviously on the technology and the security, but then just as much on our staff and making sure that our staff is trained and understands the risks and has the necessary tools to, to navigate that. Um, yeah. I feel like Harvey had a really good one here. Can you speak to balancing upward rate pressure with the challenges ahead? I feel like that's all we've been talking about for the last month. So. Yeah, that's like, that's our whole job, my whole job <laughs> is to think about that. And um, I think that, I think the answer is sort of in the question, which is that it's a balance, right? So we continually think about, we have big challenges, we know things are changing quickly and making sure that we, it's one of the things I love about being a member owned cooperative and our board is made up of 12 people who live in the community. So when they make decisions, they're going home and talking to their neighbor about like what's going on. And I think that is um, really valuable to have that viewpoint in the boardroom uh, because they're balancing that too. And thinking about, um, yeah, we've got big challenges, but you know, I, with our team here, I often equate it to like a house, right? Some sort of infrastructure a lot of people can relate to. It's like, you have lots of things you'd love to do on your house, right? You have a wish list. You probably have some things you need to fix. I bought a house that was built in the 60s and it's a long, it's a long, long list. Um, and you can't do everything all at once. So it's really just spending time, I would say, in two areas. One, being really clear that we understand the world around us and what those challenges are and what our opportunities were in. So, so being really clear about what is um what is that, what does that world look like and, and where do we need to go and having a very clear vision about what we want to do as an organization. And then once you have really a lot of clarity about what those opportunities are, what the challenges are and where you want to go, then it's a, a lot of prioritization, right? So just thinking about what are you going to give up when you can't do everything, what has to get done. Um, and that is, we're actually working on that right now and working through um, what we expect to be a quite a hefty rate increase again um, this year, which is, um, we did one last year, probably another one coming this year. And it's just about trying to cut it down to making sure we're moving forward in this energy future. And also knowing that the bill is, you know, the, the amount people pay for each kilowatt hour is really what drives that affordability. Um, and at the end, the ability to afford um, heat pumps and transportation and moving things to electrical. So, um, I don't know that I had, that's the recipe. I don't have a perfect answer, but that's what we spend a lot of time doing. 
All right, I think it's my question, my turn to ask a question and uh, we're quarter of, so maybe just um, one last question. And I think this was an, an interesting one because it talks a little bit about storage, but also the future, which is what is VEC's approach to storing electricity produced um, with renewable resources for later use during peak hours? What are we, what are we doing it? What's the opportunity? What are we doing in that space? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I'll say that um, we haven't been doing too much in this space, but we're very eager to experiment. And, and one project in particular I bring up is, is a pilot project, actually a joint project with Green Mountain Power and uh, grant funded through the Department of Energy um, in, in our Shi'ai region, which may be a term that some of our listeners or our viewers have, have, have heard of before. And it's actually a, a constrained area. So there's actually too much generation in that region can't get out on the transmission system. And what happens is basically as a result of that, the wind turbines and the and the larger facilities up there are curtailed, turned off during those uh, times of excess, which has you know a negative impact on our on our power supply portfolio. Um, so what we're trying to do with that battery is balance the revenue that I talked about, the reduction in peak uh, transmission costs with also this transmission constraint and actually soaking up some of that excess energy to therefore reduce the amount that these um, these wind turbines have to be shut down. So I think we're going to learn a lot in that experiment. That's hopefully going to be online later this year. And, and over the next year, we'll be able to experiment more. And I think the learnings from that can then be applied into um, our residential battery storage program as well, right? Um, and, and that's certainly going to become more and more critical. Those markets don't necessarily exist today, but this transmission constraint is fairly unique to us, right? So that's that's a market that we've created. I think a regional market will show up at some point for leveraging these battery resources for, um, you know, generation constraints in the region, and therefore that that opportunity will come up. So I think we're positioning ourselves really well to be able to take advantage of that in the future. All right, good one. I'm excited about that too, um, to yeah. see what it looks like, and then as other types of storage show up either that are um, either longer term or maybe more cost effective, hopefully than lithium ion, then we have that experience to be able to take advantage of that. Great. Sorrel, um, I'll leave it to you. Either anything we didn't hit on that you're excited about VEC or we can ask one more question. I feel like we've just got a few more minutes. Yeah, um, just I, I think Jake is going to mention this too, but we're still getting like tons of questions like please send those in we're more than happy myself Rebecca anyone on the VC team to to answer those like we're, we'd love to see that there's like been so much interaction. I think the, the one last piece I'll touch on, and you're going to laugh, Rebecca, because you know I wanted to answer this one, but we had several questions on, on uh, it's kind of related to the storage piece on, on whether or not we could use these electric charters to be made in a bi-directional way. Vehicle to grid is a term that's being very heavily used. And absolutely, that's something that we would love to make happen. I would say two big issues there. One is the amount of manufacturers out there producing these chargers today is very limited. Um, Ford has one. There's a couple other small vendors, right? So the space is very early. And I think a bigger constraint, many of you may have seen those who are electric vehicle owners or not, that recently um, the electric vehicle manufacturers have basically decided to go towards the Tesla standard, the North American charging standard, which is going to change the plug um, for, for these chargers, which is going to have a pretty significant impact, right, on, on existing vehicles and their ability to kind of leverage these new um, chargers that are coming out, right? So I think it's something that we're super excited about, ready to experiment on, but it's just a little bit early. Um, but, you know, the, the, the stat that I always like to use is there's about 10 times the amount of battery storage in all of the vehicles going out there today than is being installed on the grid, right? So there's a huge potential there. And absolutely, we would love nothing more than to be able to expand our flexible load programs to leverage those devices for, for grid, you know, uh, services in some sort. So I'll finish it with that. Thank you. <laughs> good one. That's a good one. All right, Jake, you're going to wrap us up here. I'm going to wrap us up. Right. I'm going to wrap us up. Fantastic. What a, what a great job. What great information. Um, uh, those who've joined, thanks for taking your time, time today to, to join us. We've had a lot of great questions. I mean, this has been really fantastic and there are plenty of questions that still haven't been addressed. So I would uh, advise anybody who didn't feel their question was addressed or has something that's come up in the meantime to email me directly and I can, I can follow up with them. It's jbrown at vermontelectric.coop. Um, you know, we're always working and trying to uh, enhance the way we 
connect with our members. And, you know, this is a great way. This is our first webinar. Um, and, um, you know, we'd love to hear about other ideas you all might have for future webinars that we could do. Um, so please uh, send those along too, if you have a chance. Um, in the meantime, check our website, vermontelectric.colp for information of all sorts, including information we covered today. Uh, join us uh, on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, all the social media, and um, just wonderful having everybody on, and we really appreciate it. And from all of us at BEC, have a wonderful afternoon.